Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be getting started with our webinar shortly. Appreciate you logging in and, and joining us for the presentation. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to announce some upcoming events that we have, upcoming courses. Um, next Thursday and Friday, February 11th and 12th, we'll be hosting CUEH Builds Bridges, our annual event in cooperation with UC Berkeley and UC Davis. And it, our theme this year is interdisciplinary and ethical response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This virtual symposium is going to feature interactive panel discussions and Q&A, and also include pre-recorded presentations that will be available starting this Friday. Sessions are also going to be recorded and will be made available following the event for learners who aren't able to attend the complete live symposium. Also coming up next week on Tuesday, February 9th, we've partnered with the Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health to offer a free webinar on the air surface interface of viral contamination. What can exposure modeling tell us? And on Wednesday, February 17th, we've partnered with the UC Ergonomics Research and Graduate Training Program to offer a free webinar on evaluation of exoskeleton use in construction. For more about these events, you can visit us at cueh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on Workplace Vibration, Health Hazards, Measurement Protocol, and Controls, presented by Michael Strange, CIH. Thank you so much for being here today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You'll be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. We'll save time at the end of the presentation to ad address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will also receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and an evaluation form that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter for today. Michael Strange, CIH, began his career as an analytical chemist at Fireman's Fund Environmental Laboratory. Then he worked as a field industrial hygienist under the direction of a certified industrial hygienist for the FPE group, which is a fire protection engineering firm, before becoming a CIH himself in 1990. He evaluates airborne chemical hazards, noise, radiation, vibration, and heat stress exposures to workers, as well as indoor air quality and office environments, manufacturing facilities, chemical and pharmaceutical, medical facilities, agriculture, hospitality, agriculture, construction, office buildings, among other environments. Currently, he's a principal consultant for Chubb Global Risk Advisors assigned to the Pacific Northwest. However, he also practices internationally with experience in Australia, Europe, North Africa, Canada, and Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Oh, it's my pleasure, Michelle. Thank you for uh, hosting me. And uh, thank all of you who uh, registered and attended this course. I think it's a uh, very under-assessed um, um, physical hazard. And uh, I'm very happy that you're all here. I, I hope you'll find this useful. Um, first of all, um, I have to uh, show our attorney's disclaimer, and I promise you it's the busiest slide that you'll see in the presentation. It basically tells you who we are and what we do. Uh, I work for the group that is the uh, envir um, Environmental Health and Safety um, Risk, um, Risk Evaluation Group uh, called Chubb Global Risk Advisors, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Chubb Insurance. And the main point of this disclaimer is while the, while the company uh, promotes or uh, supports my um, uh, giving these presentations, uh, the uh, opinions and the positions expressed in this uh, are my only and do not necessarily reflect those of the company. So there we have it. Uh, here's what I'm gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about vibration. Um, both hand-arm vibration, uh, obviously the acronym is HAV, and in the literature you'll also see uh, sometimes HTV, which stands for hand transmissible vibration, and it's the same thing. And then of course, whole body vibration. Uh, we'll talk about its occurrence uh, in the workplace, uh, what the effects are of exposure, the physical symptoms, and uh, uh, what can develop from it. 
We'll talk about what uh, standards and guidelines are in place uh, in the US and elsewhere. Uh, we'll talk about the measurement of it and control measures. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite you to uh, do a poll. And I wanna ask uh, how many field evaluations for vibrations uh, have you performed annually uh, before COVID, which obviously changed everything? Um, don't be embarrassed if uh, you say none because there are, you know, it's not done a lot in this country, as far as I can tell. So please uh, fill out the evacua uh, evaluation and uh, hit submit. Wow, okay. That's just about what I thought. Um, Michelle, can everybody see this uh, see this result? Uh, yes, they can. Okay, good. Well, 73% uh, of you have not done any and uh, the bulk have done one to five. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what I was expecting. I would be willing to bet that the 10 to 50 is probably an ergonomist um, because I think it's more your area than it is the industrial hygienist. So thank you for that. And next, I've got another poll coming up here. Of those vibration surveys, um, eh, come on. How many of those field evaluations were in the US? Okay, just about uh, just about the same number, just about the same number. Uh, one percent at over a hundred percent in the U.S. And uh, okay, that makes sense. Well, I'll tell you, I have not done a single one in the U.S. Uh, so far, I have only done these in um, uh, in Europe. So. Again, I think even from those statistics that we just saw, uh, it is it is very much and under-evaluated uh, um, physical hazard. So, okay. So uh, here's some uh, statistics from a uh, uh, 1974 NIOSH study where they estimated that uh, 1.2 million workers in the US were potentially exposed to hand-arm vibration and therefore at the risk of developing a hand-arm vibration uh, syndrome. Now, admittedly, this is very dated material, but old data is still good data. And it's the first and most thorough um, study that I found. Now, from this 1974 study, NIOSH uh, developed a bulletin or released a bulletin in 1983 stating that uh, vibration syndrome is probably severely underreported by workers and health professionals. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, it's not regulated. And second of all, uh, workers tend to underreport since the symptoms are uh, intermittent and often occur uh, at times that are under conditions that are not present in a doctor's office, like happening early in the morning or when your hands are cold or wet. Now in uh, 2009, I mean, sorry, 2019, NIOSH estimated that uh, hand arm vibration system affects 50% of workers that use vibrating tools, which amounts to about 1.45 million workers, asympt or, I'm sorry, symptomatic workers in America. So here's primarily what we're talking about when we say hand arm vibration system uh, syndrome. And this is what NIOSH studied in 1974, the occurrence of uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, Dr. Maurice Raynaud was a 19th century doctor, and he described this condition of a, as a local syncope or a loss of blood circulation, where one or more fingers become white and cold all at once. And in his doctoral thesis of 1862, he reported symptoms of intermittent pallor and cyanosis at the extremities, which in severe cases could lead to the development of gangrene. Now, at the time of his thesis, Raynaud had not yet recognized that the condition 
could sometimes be initial symptoms of a severe general disease. And that's why today we refer to primary and secondary Raynaud's syndromes. Uh, primary being the spontaneous appearance and secondary relating to a specific cause. In uh, Raynaud's time, before power tools, it was thought to be triggered by cold temperatures, anxiety, or stress. And the condition occurs because blood vessels go into a temporary spasm, which blocks the flow. And this causes the affected area to change color to white, then blue, then red as blood flow returns. One can also experience numbness and pain. And the symptoms of Renos can last from a few minutes to several hours at a time. And these blanching attacks could become more progressively severe over the years, leading to blue and cold fingers. And the skin can become uh, atrophic, ulcerated, or even gangrenous. Uh, people with Renos often go for long periods without any symptoms. And sometimes the condition goes away altogether. Now, there are other parts of the body that can be affected by Raynaud's too, and these include the ears, nose, nipples, and the lips. Secondary Raynaud's is where it can be correlated with a specific cause like fractures or lacerations, uh, connective tissue disease, or a long history of high blood pressure. And we know today that exposures to vinyl chloride can be a cause or a contributing factor, as well as a history of vibration exposure. Uh, just to give you a uh, time frame, uh, Renault was uh, uh, 19th century, and the first power tool was invented in 1895 by a German company called CNE Fine. Uh, that particular instrument combined an electric motor and a manual drill, and it weighed 16 pounds. So it's obviously not easy to use by our standards. Um, consequently, uh, Renault's phenomenon became much more common during the 20th and 21st century. Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce a second one, although uh, this one is not considered, or at least at the time of NIOSH's study, was not considered a uh, vibration-related uh, uh, disease. But we're finding out more recently that, uh, that it is associated with vibration as well. It's called uh, Dupuytren's uh, contracture. And it's, uh, it's an abnormal thickening of the skin in the palm of the hand at the uh, base of the fingers. Now this thickened area can develop into a hard lump or a thick uh, band. And over time, it can cause one or more fingers uh, to curl or contract or to pull sideways or in toward the palm as you see that ring finger is doing on the left. Now, this phenomena, as I said, was not included in the NIOSH 1974 study. Uh, but so it's a vibration related injury. Um, uh, even though it's a vibration in, uh, injury, it's not historically been considered so. Um, the literature seems to suggest that uh, hand arm vibration syndrome and Raynaud's syndrome are pretty synonymous. Uh, Dupuytren's disease also has other multiple causes, including very heavy material labor as well as vibration. And I, again, I'm including it here because it's more recently been tagged as an outcome of it, of vibration. Uh, folklore is nicknamed uh, Dupuytren's disease as the Viking disease because its frequency is high in many Northern European countries where the Vikings settled. But there are nine or 10 different genes associated with Dupuytren's contracture, which suggests that it may have evolved on several different occasions. Also, the known uh, prehistoric cases, like uh, found in an Egyptian mummy, are very clearly pre-Viking. As well, the Japanese, with no Viking ancestry at all, have a high instance of Dupuytren's disease. <clears throat> so the story isn't really that simple. Uh, when I say there are nine or 10 different genes, again, these are genes that would make you more susceptible to it, but without the susceptibility gene plus the environmental exposure, you probably would not go forward and catch either of these diseases. Um, again, it does appear that it's more frequent in the Northern lat uh, latitude populations like the Japanese and uh, the Northern European, uh, but it's really not known why at this time. Uh, it's very rare in Indian and African populations. Uh, I also want to do a sidebar on a, uh, another folklore story that uh, links it with a Scottish bag playing, bagpipe playing uh, McCrimmon clan. 
In the 16th century, the uh, Clan MacLeod were chieftains of the uh, Isle of Skye, and the McCrimmons were their pipers, a very prestigious uh, position at court. The story goes that a McCrimmon woman by the name of Anag was punished, punished for giving piping secrets to her lover by the removal of several fingers. And she foretold that the McCrimmons would cease to be the official pipers in the clouds and would leave the Isle of Skye forever. And as it turned out, it did happen that way. The fingers of the McCrimmon men bent so far into their palms that they became unable to play the bagpipes anymore. And today, many pipers who suffer from um, Dupuytren's disease may tell you that he's uh, been affected by the curse of the McCrimmons. Now, if this story really happened, uh, the poor woman was probably burned at the stake as a witch for cursing the pipers and causing the disorder. So aren't you glad we live in an age of science? So uh, science first appears uh, in terms of this disease in 1614, when it was uh, first written into the medical records in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, Dr. Felix Platter examined a stone mason, mason whose uh, left ring finger and little finger were contracted into his palm. From Platter's description, it seems likely he was able to dissect the hand uh, after the man's death too, so he was able to characterize it well. But obviously we don't call it Platter's disease today. <coughs> In 1831, Baron Guillaume du Puitron, uh, head physician at a famous Parisian hospital, uh, L'Hôtel Dieu, dissected the hand of a patient who'd been suffering from finger contractures and diagnosed the cause as uh, coming from the fascia, as I showed you in the uh, 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 photograph or the diagram. In his lectures at the Hotel Dieu in 1832, he described this dissection and also a case he'd treated on June 12th. He'd operated on a man with contracted fingers and performed an open fasciotomy or cutting through the skin and the fascia without anesthesia, of course. <clears throat> By July 2nd, the post-operative infection and inflammation had gone and the patient could use his hand again. Dupuytren didn't suture any of the wounds, but uh, left them open to heal. He carried out another demonstration by operating on a patient in front of the audience while giving the lecture. Since uh, Dupuytren claimed to have been the first to recognize the cause of the disease and to suggest a way of treating it, that's why it bears his name and it probably also helped that he was a baron. Uh, January, 2021, National Library of Medicine article recently asked the question, is Dupuytren's disease an occupational illness? In other words, is it associated with vibration or other potential sources, occupational sources? So, and, and again, this is very recent. This is only last month that this article was published. The study concluded uh, 515 male workers in Košice, Slovakia. The participants were divided into three groups, those exposed to hand arm vibrations, those exposed to heavy manual work, and a control group. The researchers evaluated the association between Dupuytren's disease and hand arm vibrations, um, um, heavy manual work, and also uh, compared it against cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases, epilepsy, smoking, and alcohol consumption for all groups. And the study compared the length of exposure time to hand arm vibration and heavy manual work between the workers with and without uh, Dupuytren's disease. And they found significant associations between Dupuytren's and older ages, and also between depuitons and alcohol consumption. But no associations were found for any of the other variables like uh, cardiac or, um, or the others that I mentioned. So they, uh, the recommendation from this survey, and again, it's been very recent, uh, is that it should be considered as uh, occupational disease and therefore compensable. So I just wanted to let you know that because that's kind of cutting edge uh, technology here. Okay, now getting back to uh, vibration syndrome, which again, from now on, we'll consider synonymous with uh, Raynaud's syndrome. In the 1974 NIOSH evaluation and the subsequent 1983 bulletin, 
Uh, they found that the severity of vibration could be measured using this grading system developed by W. Taylor. He was the author of The Vibration White Finger, which by the way was published by London Press in 1974. As I said, this classification only refers to Raynaud's syndrome. The top lettered stages um, um, shown above there refer to sensory neuro symptoms, uh, things like tingling and uh, numbness. Uh, and the bottom four numbered stages refer to the more severe vascular or circulatory problems, or it could be combined sensory neuro and vascular syndromes. Naya studied uh, 385 workers exposed to hand arm vibration in that 1974 study. And this was from pneumatic chipping hammers and grinders at two foundries and a shipyard. The control group included only those workers who had never used vibrating hand tools. And uh, they worked in the same work locations as the control workers, exposed groups and control workers. A physician on the research team who had experience uh, diagnosing vibration syndrome, examined each worker in a double blind study and neither the worker nor the physician was told if the work was classified as exposed or in the control group. In the foundries, you'll see that 47% uh, of exposed workers had advanced vibration syndrome, stage one or more severe, and 19% of exposed shipyard workers. Now, adding in the less severe stages, vibration syndrome symptoms were found in 83% of exposed foundry workers and in 64% of exposed shipyard workers. <clears throat> no workers in the control group were found to be symptomatic. There's a direct uh, relationship between the number of years exposed and the severity of vibration syndrome. This table shows the uh, relationship in uh, foundry workers using the chipping hammers. The milding, milder symptoms remain at 48% from less than 18 months up to three years. Then after three years, you see how that number drops and the more severe syndromes, 0203, uh, jump to 50%. The milder 01 syndrome remained about the same. Now recall that 01 through 04 are the, uh, are the circulatory or the combined symptoms, the more severe. Now going down to the neurological only symptoms, OT, ON, and TN, they started highest at 48%, dropping to 14% as cases became more severe over time. The non-symptomatic group dropped from 21% to 11, and then creeped back up to 15, but you notice how the total number of workers within each category of years of vibration also varied. So you might, you probably expect some variation in the uh, percentages as well. And how about the shipyard workers? Recall their case numbers were less than the foundry workers. And this table tracks their exposure duration and severity of symptoms over a 15 uh, year period. And it more or less follows a similar pattern. Uh, culminating in more severe symptoms after 15 years of exposure, which we would expect since we know that the dose makes the poison and the length of time exposed to a chemical or physical hazard only increases the uh, likelihood and severity of the occupational disease. So I ask myself a lot, why aren't we out there doing more vibration studies? And again, we do it in Europe because it's regulated. Uh, you have to do a study if you, they're exposed to any amount of vibration, and then you implement controls or uh, a medical surveillance program where, uh, where they're above certain limits, and I'll show you those limits later. Um, and, you know, the data from NIOSH in 1983 tells us we should probably be doing the same thing here. Now, I apologize for throwing two different classification systems at you. But I had to show you the archaic system first, since that's what was applied to the data at the time that NIOSH developed its bulletin, 1983. <clears throat> in 1987, four years after the NIOSH bulletin, the taylor Palmyra uh, classification system was replaced by this uh, Stockholm Workshop hand arm vibration system classification system. And um, You'll see it's, uh, it's very similar to the other table. Uh, I actually had to split this one into two slides. 
The first one shows the vascular um, symptoms, uh, the more severe vascular um, with possibly uh, sensory neural. And uh, the stages are still numbered progressively more severe, zero to four. And if you notice the note on the bottom, uh, each hand is assessed individually. So the two L2 over one R1 indicates a uh, uh, stage two Renault on the left hand and two fingers, stage one Renault on the right hand in one finger. Um, okay, here are the uh, sensory neuro symptom classifications um, of the of this part of the previous chart there. And this is without the circulatory system. So this is the less severe group. The Stockholm system is used by ACGIH and uh, by the European Union. So, so if you're looking at current data, this is what you uh, want to be able to compare it to in terms of the, uh, the, the worker response. So let's move into uh, whole body vibration. First, let's talk about uh, vibrating platforms. Examples of this could include uh, recycled processing plants, where employees sort recyclable material while standing on a platform that's attached to the conveyor. Um, and the same process is used in fruit and vegetable processing plants where employees have to sort out the stems and leaves from the regular product. Now, even without a platform, uh, sources of vibrations can uh, impact the floor directly. And these could include mixers in uh, bakeries, uh, ice cream plants, uh, even hot dog facilities and uh, others, hot dog manufacturing plants that is. So these are locations where there could be vibrations through the floor. Obviously uh, truck driving or driving a heavy equipment is also a potential source. And uh, hand tools that can affect the whole body system like jackhammering, or this ground working machine that's pictured here. So uh, here are some of the uh, uh, symptoms of uh, whole body vibration uh, exposure. And I've heard most of these complaints from employees who work on these vibrating platforms, in fact. Mainly you get uh, neck and, pe uh, neck and pain, uh, back pain, excuse me. Uh, Potential cardiovascular, they may or may not have been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. They may just have complaints of chest pain uh, or racing heart. Uh, digestive problems are an issue. Um, for neuropathies, they will usually describe symptoms of uh, stabbing pain, burning or tingling, maybe numbness, uh, headache, dizziness, motion sickness, and uh, it could lead to cancer. Other risk factors uh, include, um, you know, static postures, standing in one place all day. Uh, when you reach across that line, you have to turn as you pull that recycled product from the line. Also, uh, heavy lifting, lifting uh, increases that um, the risk factor. And I talked about co-exposure to chemicals a little bit earlier. In the in the case of vinyl chloride, we can know it uh, can cause Raynaud's uh, independently of vibration. Uh, or could exasperate, uh, exacerbate an existing um, uh, vibration exposure. Some of the other co-exposures, uh, truck drivers and construction workers uh, may be exposed to diesel exhaust gases and vapors. Um, diesel exhaust inhalation has been linked with the development of respiratory and cardiovascular problems, asthma, as well as the development of certain kinds of cancer. At construction sites, uh, workers may also inhale dust from earth moving and wood cutting processes, uh, drywall or mixing concrete. And studies have found that inhalation uh, of these different types of dust could be associated with an increase in respiratory and in some cases, cardiovascular disease. Uh, let's see, sorry, let me go back, catch up. Uh, agriculture workers can be exposed to vibration as well as various pesticides and pesticides have been associated with the development of uh, peripheral neuropathies. So again, this could be a synergistic effect, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, as well as reproductive problems. Now, understanding how these various exposures can contribute to the development of vibration syndrome 
it's important uh, to determine the best actions to take to reduce these, uh, the instance of uh, disease. So who is at uh, risk from hand arm vibration? And whole, I'm sorry, whole body vibration. Uh, the uh, transportation warehousing and utilities uh, uh, district uh, or sector makes up about 3.2% of the workforce, according to a 2018 article from the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. Now, these are the people that transport uh, goods and passengers uh, by air, road, rail, and by water. In 2015, about 775,000 workers, which is about 22% of all TWU workers, missed days because of injuries or illness. And the common injury and illness included back, neck, shoulder pains, headaches and dizziness, motion sickness, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular and peripheral sensory problems. Now, all these could be associated with excessive uh, vibration exposure as well. About 8% of the workforce is in ag, forestry and fisheries. The ag industry includes animal husbandry, um, crop production and maintenance. In forestry, most workers are in the logging industry. Primary exposures to whole body vibrations are vehicles like tractors, combines, and bulldozers, and hand arm vibration through vibrating tools like chainsaws. Workers are most likely to miss work due to physical injuries or musculoskeletal disorders <clears throat> because of heavy lifting, maintaining static or awkward postures for long periods, uh, as well as vibration. They can also be exposed to other factors like pesticides and extreme temperatures. And these exposures along with vibration increases the risk of developing certain cancers, respiratory problems, and neurodegenerative diseases. Workers in the fishing industry are exposed to both whole body and hand arm vibration. And this is generated by the motor and lift equipment on boats or by the motion of the boat, especially in rough water. And exposure can result in injury to the spine, knees, and hips, also fatigue, headaches, and uh, motion sickness. 4% of workers are, uh, excuse me, 7.9% of workers, I'm sorry, go back. 4% of US workers are in construction and about 0.4 are in mining. Now workers in these sectors are usually exposed to uh, ex whole body vibration as well as hand arm by driving large earth moving equipment like bulldozers and dump trucks or using hand tools like drills and jack hammers and uh, uh, sanders. <clears throat> Vibration along with the awkward or static postures and heavy lifting loads uh, can contribute to the musculoskeletal disorders. Also, uh, they can be exposed to dust and chemicals. Uh, we talked about some of those, coal dust, concrete, wood, silica, diesel fuel, and other solvents. And all these can have a contributing effect. Now, 7.9% of workers are employed in manufacturing. Uh, an estimated 74% of these are exposed to vibration. Hand arm from tools like grinders, impact wrenches, sanders and drills. Whole body from vibrating platforms, vehicles and floors near vibrating equipment. Uh, there are experiments that uh, have examined the effects of single bouts of vibration in humans. And they've shown that uh, the physiological biological response to free to, uh, vibration are frequency dependent. So as with noise, vibrations measured by weighting the more harmful frequencies. And that's logical because noise is a type of vibration. In fact, a person can experience hearing loss by exposure to vibration alone, even if there is no noise exposure. At the 100 to 300 Hertz range, that is the uh, resonant frequency of the hand finger si uh, system. So it's prone to an increase of uh, uh, increased biodynamic response, specifically a greater reduction in blood flow to the tissues, an increase in the cold finger blanching, and more likely to induce pain and reduce tactile sensitivity. The 10 to 60 Hertz targets the rest of the arm and the shoulder. And this results in a faster fatigue of muscles and uh, increased discomfort. So let's talk about standards and guidelines right now. 
Uh, there's currently no OSHA permissible exposure limit. Uh, OSHA has come out with work practice guidelines. Vibration is mentioned in the proposed federal OSHA ergonomic standard, but it's still not mandatory. OSHA has been enforcing ergonomics, including vibration, under the general duty clause. Now, as again, OSHA does have some work practice guidelines, which I'll cover in a later slide. Cal OSHA has two ergonomic standards, but neither one mentions vibration. One addresses repetitive motion injuries and the other addresses patient handling. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists or ACGIH, it's a nonprofit scientific organization that advances occupational and environmental health standards. Uh, they have developed the threshold limit value for chemical and physical hazards, the TLV. And these are recommended occupational exposure limits, which have been adopted as the legal limits in just about every country in the world, ironically, except our own, which still uses the OSHA PEL. And even OSHA admits on its website that the PELs are outdated and may not adequately be protective of employee health. Moving to uh, the European Union, as I said, vibration is regulated there. And as you can see for the hand arm vibration, it pretty much follows the, uh, uh, the TLV and uh, for both the exposure limit value. And this is the value that should not be exceeded at all for the eight hour day. And then the action value, which is roughly 50% of the TLV, uh, or in this case, the um, um, exposure limit value versus the exposure action level value in Europe. And you see the, uh, for whole body vibration, it's uh, somewhat higher than the, uh, than the TLV. Here's a table showing the TLV and action level broken down by hours as weighted acceleration. So this is how much you could expose uh, an employee to for 15 minutes a day versus an hour versus two going on to 10. Now the formulas that derive these particular numbers are shown at the bottom where A is equal to the acceleration. Uh, the vibration is measured in acceleration meters per second squared and time is in hours. Uh, fortunately, uh, the instrument software will calculate these for you, which is a huge time saver. And here are the TLV and action levels for the whole body vibrations um, for the various times, like shown in the previous chart. Now, the notice of intended changes uh, for 2021, uh, they anticipate rounding off some significant difference digits, but they don't uh, anticipate changing the TLV values this year. And uh, this, is, this is right out of the TLV booklet. So you can find this information there. So how do we measure vibration? Uh, this picture shows the direction of the acceleration components along the X, Y, Z axis. This slide uh, shows basically two generations of the Savantec hand arm vibration meters. Now I'm not endorsing any one product today. Uh, since we rent specialty equipment like this, we, uh, we use the model that the rental company has. And I'll admit, I don't have experience with any other vibration manufacturer. So I couldn't give you comparisons or endorsements even if I wanted to. I'm looking forward to the next in-person conference so that I can get around to compare them. The, uh, the picture on the right shows the older model of Symantec using a circuit board that you see uh, that I'm holding in my hand and it's attached to wires that are going to the uh, down the worker's sleeves down to the, uh, the probes down to uh, each hand you see the left hand here, there's a similar probe on the other hand. Now the newer Symantec models and that's the upper left hand photo. Uh, it's a, a single contained probe and recorder uh, that's all in one unit. Now, all these probes are omnidirectional, which makes vibration measurement much easier than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. 
Now going back to the right hand photos, you see, you see I've attached the wires on the uh, worker sleeve with the uh, clips and fed them into this recorder, which I had to hold really close to them. I'm happy that this was in the days before COVID and that they have upgraded their technology since then. Uh, today, I would probably try to teach the worker how to use the, or I would set the, uh, uh, the smaller hand one on the upper left uh, to running and then demonstrate to them how to put it on and to clip it to themselves, which takes longer, but in this day of COVID, it's best to keep that six feet distance, even with masks. So with this kind of newer model, you can actually set them up and then walk away. <clears throat> that, now the advantage to the older unit was that I could simultaneously take readings on the right hand and the left hand and go into a common recorder. And it would record data log on six channels, uh, three directions on the right hand and three directions on the left. But with a newer one, you'd have to do them either one at a time or rent two instruments and uh, have both hands uh, measured at the same time uh, being recorded separately in each separate instrument. Uh, when people use a tool, they tend to favor one hand or another, uh, but we do have uh, ambidextrous people in the work community. And it really is much better if the worker is able to change hands and then you wind up spreading that vibration exposure and you actually cut it in half for each hand. Uh, but again, when most people use a tool, they, tool, they tend to use one hand or the other. Uh, but sometimes they may also be bracing a surface which could be vibrating. And so whether they're ambidextrous or not, I still like to get measurements on both hands. And the final thing I want to mention on this slide, if you look, notice the lower left hand corner, it shows how the probe fits into the hand. And notice that the concave side goes on the side of the tool and the convex side goes on the side of the hand against the palm. So moving to whole body measurements, vibration. Again, at the left is a newer model, at the right is the older model connected to a wire that goes to the same recorder that uh, measured the hand arm vibration. You just have to reprogram it between hand arm and whole body and then back to hand arm. So uh, the whole body vibration probe looks like a phonograph record. Um, uh, on the right, again, it's the older model. Um, now here I'm measuring a, uh, the floor around an air handling unit. And since you're measuring vibration to a person, you have to have contact with the meter between the person and the vibrating surface. Uh, with a vehicle, you would place the probe on the seat or have the and have the driver sit on it, or you'd attach it to the seat back. And actually, I prefer to measure both. You know, ideally, if your customer has enough uh, rental funds, it's good to rent two instruments and have one on the back simultaneously with one on the seat. And uh, uh, going back to the figure on the left there, the newer version of the model is a self-contained cordless unit and it connects uh, through a USB port to download on the computer. Um, my advice to you is if, you've, if you're not really familiar with these instruments in advance, that you get them in advance and spend a few days with them and troubleshoot them and figure them out before you get um, in front of your customer. Um, so also the uh, software, uh, at least for Savant Tech is pretty complicated. So you will want to allow yourself plenty of time for a learning curve. So here's an example summary table that I use showing both hand arm vibration and whole body uh, vibration. Uh, this was a job in France and I translated as much back into English as I could, mainly the uh, subject headers. The locations I left pretty much the same because I pretty much read those off the signs and um, uh, it's, it's above my level of French, I'm afraid. Um, again, now this particular table um, uh, combines both hand arm and whole body vibration. And that's why you see gaps in the table uh, where it wasn't applicable. Uh, like if I was using the whole body meter, uh, I just leave the hand arm blank and vice versa. <clears throat> now at the, uh, you notice the uh, two columns at the last are probably the 
um, the most critical uh, measurements that, uh, that you take or values that you'll look at. Uh, it calculates both the actual results in meters per second squared and how long it would take to get to the European exposure action value and the time to reach the exposure limit value. And uh, that's very useful information that the software gives you. You can also program that to, to do that by the TLV as, as well and report it that way. Along with the table, I usually prefer, I usually add a uh, profile where I can. Um, and uh, with hand arm vibration and whole body vibration, you can add the, include these profile sheets in the report. I do the same thing with audio dosimetry results and with electromagnetic field strength results. This particular one is a hand arm and you'll see the top chart shows the, or profile shows the uh, exposure to the right hand and the left shows uh, to the left hand. Now uh, you see from the, uh, the green below the daily exposure and the last columns, last two columns, time to reach the EAV and ELV, um, it does not pose a significant vibration risk to either hand because an employee would not be working that job, not likely be working that job that many hours a day. Uh, you might reach the action value if you were doing a double shift, but probably not with breaks. So this uh, is a similar profile showing the whole body vibration. And you see this result is, uh, is actually in red and uh, uh, it, shows, uh, it shows an above uh, exposure, uh, above the exposure action value and the exposure limit value uh, if they go for um, long enough. In this case, 24 minutes for the exposure action value and uh, about two hours for the exposure limit value. <coughs> okay, so let's, uh, here's some uh, OSHA uh, engineering control guidelines. Here's some things you can do. You can use uh, vibration isolators or damping techniques on the equipment. You can isolate machine vibrations from the surface if it's mounted, or you can use uh, vibration isolation mounts. The vibrating panels of uh, machine housings and guards can be controlled by using uh, damping materials applied to panels. Uh, that might also help you reduce noise exposure as well. Uh, felts, liquid mastics, and elastomeric damping sheets uh, can be effective damping materials. So uh, going on with OSHA guidelines, uh, work practices, uh, you can restrict the number of hours that a worker uses a vibrating hand tool or uh, drive a forklift during the workday. And you want to allow employees to take uh, 10 to 15 minute breaks uh, from vibration every hour. If you can arrange work tasks so that vibrating and non-vibrating tools can be used alternately, you give the hands a chance to heal from the vibration exposure before coming back to further exposure. You want to train workers about the hazards of uh, working with vibration tools and uh, should include the, uh, what the sources of vibration exposure are, the signs and symptoms of hand-arm vibration syndrome, and what work practices they can use for minimizing vibration exposure. And uh, instruct workers to keep the hands warm and dry and not to grip a vibrating tool too tightly. Uh, you should allow the tool or machine to do the work rather than uh, your grip strength. Now, that last suggests to me that one representative measurement of one employee does not necessarily speak for all employees' work style. So it is important to get around and uh, uh, test each one. Okay, so going to uh, ACGIH guidelines, here are some of the controls uh, um, um, that ACGI suggests. First of all, adherence to the TLV. If you can keep the vibration exposure below that, um, uh, you should be good. The use of uh, anti-vibration tools wherever possible. Anti-vibration gloves are a possibility um, as long as the glove does not restrict a tool operator's ability to work safely or the glove material actually increases the transmission of the vibration. 
Workers uh, should adhere to the code of practice, which I'll show you on the next slide. And uh, there should be a conscientiously applied medical surveillance program uh, where you're above the, uh, um, the ACGIH action level, or in the case of Europe, above the exposure and action, level, action value. So here are those uh, recommended uh, code of work practices. You want to uh, define within the work area what tools are uh, vibration sources and determine the times and uh, introduce work breaks to avoid the constant continued exposure. And if possible, again, measure the vibration to level of tools to estimate exposure. Uh, that's where we come in. You want to clinically monitor the progress of hand arm vibration syndrome deterioration where uh, it's, it's already been established that this is happening. And the monitoring should include measuring the severity and number of increasing attacks uh, and the things like blanching or tingling and so forth uh, that occur in summer as well as winter. You want to remove those workers with moderate to severe hand arm vibration syndrome uh, from further vibration exposure because it's only going to get worse. Uh, before uh, employing someone, it's a good idea to have a physician evaluate them for any vascular disorders that uh, could affect the hand because it make them, may make them predisposed to a vibration related illness. Uh, if you can eliminate smoking, uh, it aggravates the vasospasm. Obviously, we have no control whether employees smoke or not, but it sh should encourage uh, non-smoking. I mentioned before, you grasp the tools as lightly as possible in order to uh, reduce the vibration uh, impact to the, uh, directly to the hand. Workers who develop symptoms of tingling or numbness on especially signs of white or blue fingers should be examined by a physician who's knowledgeable in uh, hand-arm vibration syndrome. And uh, warnings should be placed on hand tools. Uh, this is actually a requirement in Europe to have a uh, warning labels. Um, going back to the gloves, vibration gloves, uh, you wanna recommend gloves that promote hand warming and hand dryness, <coughs> especially where they use uh, vibration tools in cold environments. You, you definitely don't wanna let the hands get chilled. And uh, here are some of the European provisions to achieve compliance. Now, these are backed by the force of law in Europe, where you can use other methods that require less exposure to mechanical vibration. You wanna choose work equipment of appropriate ergonomic design and take into account the work being done and produce the least amount of vibration. So that goes into your purchasing policies. <clears throat> You wanna use uh, alternative equipment that can reduce uh, the risk of injuries caused by vibrations, like uh, seats that uh, will effectively reduce whole body vibration and handles that'll reduce the vibration to the hand arm system. You want maintenance programs for work equipment, the workplace and workplace systems, since these tend to deteriorate over time and can cause more vib vibration. The uh, design of uh, and layout of workplaces and the workstations. You want to make sure to uh, train and instruct workers to use the work equipment safely and uh, correctly to uh, reduce their exposure to vibration. You want to limit the duration of exposure, appropriate work schedules with adequate rest periods. You want provision of clothing to protect workers from damp and cold. We talked about the gloves and medical surveillance. Um, again, in Europe, it's required for anyone who's exposed above the action uh, exposure action value. <clears throat> Here are some of the uh, uh, European training requirements. Uh, you want to follow the measures of the, uh, the directive uh, on vibration to eliminate or minimize the risks from vibration. The exposure, you want to ex uh, explain to employees the difference between the exposure limit values and the exposure action values, or in the case of the US, the TLV versus the action level. <clears throat> 
Uh, you want to give them the results of any assessment and measurements of the mechanical vibration that's been carried out and uh, potential injury that could arise from the work equipment in use. You want to know why and how to detect the and report the signs of injury, which uh, admittedly are subtle. Uh, you want uh, the workers to understand the circumstances uh, where they are entitled to health surveillance. Uh, safe work practices to minimize exposure to mechanical vibration. And um, we have uh, reached the uh, question and answer period. And uh, I spoke with uh, Michelle earlier. What we did last summer um, in uh, my heat stress presentation, uh, I can't promise you I'll be able to answer every question that you ask. Uh, but those that I can't answer, I'll be very happy to research offline and I'll learn myself and I'll get back with the result. And I had asked Michelle if it were possible for us to post the results of uh, uh, question and answers for everybody to, uh, to review. So with that, I will leave it open to questions, Michelle. Great, excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. We do have a, quite a few questions, so we'll do our oh. best to answer as many as we can now. And, and as Michael mentioned, um, we'll be keeping track of these questions and we'll follow up on our website with um, so, some written answers and responses for things we don't get to. Um, awesome, so let's just get started with... Um, we have a question about the 1974 NIOSH study. It mentioned 1.25 million workers were affected by HAV, HAV, and was there an estimated count of total US workers to categorize the relative impact of workers affected by this condition? Uh, I do not have that figure uh, in my notes here, but uh, that's one I will look up for you. I don't remember seeing it, but I'll see if I can uh, dig that out. Thank you. We also have a question in relation to um, physicians and whether most physicians are aware of these syndromes or if it would be better to refer to occupational physicians specifically. I think that is an excellent question. And uh, again, I do believe that, uh, yeah, you definitely want someone who has had experience uh, and can recognize the vibration related uh, uh, symptom. And those would be the occupational health people I would expect. Thank you. Um, also some questions around, how do you determine the frequency of a tool? That's a good question. I look forward to looking up that answer. <laughs> no problem. Um, also, do you sample for vibration across an entire shift? Ideally, yes. Um, in reality, you know, I get to a, a, a site in Europe and I might have a day or I might have a week. If I have a week, I also have uh, chemical sampling, I got noise assessment, I got uh, uh, electromagnetic field measurements. So realistically speaking, I'm lucky if I can get 15 minutes at a job, uh, longer if it's a forklift driver. Because <clears throat> you want to get something that's representative. And you would assume that if they're using the same tool all day, um, this is what they would get. If they use multiple tools, it would be good to do it for as long as they're using the tools. If you don't have that much time at each location, I would assess each tool individually. And you could even estimate, well, percentage of time I use this tool, percentage of time I use that tool. But you're right, nothing substitutes for monitoring them all day. Thank you. Do you know if there's any up-to-date databases of hand tool vibrations available? Well, not during my research. Um, and I dug pretty deep for it. It must be there, though. Great. Thank you. I'll look, I'll, I'll look and see if, uh, further. We also have some questions kind of related to standards. Um, I'll read the whole comment. Whereas we've seen challenges in adopting federal ergonomic standards to accommodate a varied workforce, vibration exposure seems to be more straightforward than other ergo topics that rely on anthropometric data. Are there any efforts to advocate for a federal OSHA standard for vibration alone that you're aware of? 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Read that again, Michelle, please. Oh, yes. I'm wondering if there are any efforts to advocate for a federal OSHA standard for vibration alone, aside from other ergonomics topics. Uh, I'm not aware of any, but uh, my, uh, uh, my guess is uh, that there, if there are advocates out there, the lobbyists, they're probably um, using the, um, they're probably going for the uh, whole ergonomic standard because there's way more benefit in that. Thank you. We also have a comment from someone in the UK and they mentioned oh. that the UK HSC doesn't recommend anti-vibration gloves as a mitigation measure unless necessary. Um, mm -hmm. Anti-vibration gloves may increase rather than reduce vibration at particular resonant frequencies and still meet the requirements of the standard. And this could result in an increase in the overall vibration magnitude if the machine or process operates at a rotational speed or impact rate close to a resonant frequency of the glove. Um, I, I wanted to share this because I know we've seen lots of questions coming in about the gloves. So thank you for that comment from the UK. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, uh, I, I mentioned briefly that uh, you only want to use the vibration gloves if it's not increasing the vibration. Uh, so yeah, under certain circumstances, it, it, it could be. So um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Awesome. Um, also, uh, someone asked if you have an opinion about whole body vibration exercise machines. <laughs> Hmm. Well, whole body vibration machines, you know, like a, tre you mean like a treadmill or a Stairmaster? Yeah, I, I, they just said exercise machines. So that, that was my interpretation as well. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with it. Do you want to give a little more explanation of the yeah, type that of equipment? Yeah, if that person who asked the question, if you want to provide some more detail, again, we'll, we'll keep track of these questions and, and we'll post answers for everyone to read online in the coming weeks. Um, and at this time, we are coming up on one o'clock. Um, so I will end with one final question here. Um, do you know if any vibration related diseases can be claimed through workers' compensation and et cetera as a work related illness or injury? I have not uh, seen it myself. Um, we have uh, um, an occupational disease investigation group and I will reach out to them and ask if they've come across any claims, but I've not seen any myself. I don't often get involved with claims. It's a good question. And in fact, I'll take all the questions in the chat, even those that uh, we didn't have time to read and I'll make sure those get answered too. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone for being online for the webinar.